All right, this is uh, 10 minutes past the hour, and after circulating a reminder on the on the seven platforms, we have uh, 12 members. Uh, 12 members have joined the meeting. I don't know if uh, it is okay to start with this size of people. I believe yeah. uh, some people will join us along the way. Yeah, definitely. Okay, sir. Uh, may I confirm if Dr. Wadzani is around? Dr. Dauda Wadzani, are you around, please? Okay, fine. Uh, I think I shall ask uh, Dr. Yahya Abubakar Yabo to introduce the Afri Science Network as usual before we start. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, you're all welcome to this uh, webinar organized by the Afri Science Network. The Afri Science Network aims to promote innovative and multidisciplinary scientific research and development in Africa by bringing together a community of academia and industry scholars and researchers who share similar goals. Our vibrant community consists of over 6,000 members, uh, split in six, uh, seven WhatsApp groups from A to G. Uh, these groups uh, were created for innovating and improving the quality of research and development output, increasing collaboration among researchers and, develop, uh, and developers, and providing opportunities for knowledge sharing and capacity build building. The network's missions are crucial given the challenges faced by African scientists and the potential impact of scientific research and development on the continent's socio-economic development. With the right support and resources, the Afri Science Network has the potential to transform Africa's research and development landscape and position the continent as a global hub for scientific excellence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yahya Bukariyabu, for that uh, excellent introduction uh, of the Afri Science Network. Uh, without uh, further ado, I will go on and read the uh, citation of uh, Professor Israel Agaku. Uh, Dr. Agaku Israel is an adjunct clinical professor at the University of California in San Francisco. For close to a decade, he served as a senior scientist at the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. He completed his dental training at the University of Ibadan and his dental public health residency in, uh, at the United States National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, USA. He holds a master's degree in public health from Harvard University and two PhDs one in epidemiology and the other in health systems. Dr. Agaku is the editor-in-chief for the Journal of Tobacco-Induced Diseases. He has authored over 160 manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals and has also served as an associate editor for the United States Surgeon General's Report. Dr. Agaku is a diplomat of the American Board of Dental Public Health an expert in data science and artificial intelligence. Dr. Agaku is the founder, CEO, and chief scientific officer of Chi Squares, a startup focused on building uh, cutting edge scientific tools. Uh, today, uh, distinguished uh, Professor Agaku Israel is going to uh, present our 14th webinar, uh, webinar number 14. Uh, which is titled uh, Incorporating Consent Forms in Online Surveys in a Manner that Complies with Ethical and Legal Requirements. Thank you very much, and you're highly welcome, sir. Thank you. Okay, let me share my, my slides. Um, just a sec. Let's see. Can you confirm whether you can see my screen? 
Yes, it's visible. Yeah. All right, okay. great. Okay. Right. Okay, you. super. So you can see the um, slide, the PowerPoint slides incorporating content forms. Yes. Okay. Awesome. All right. So, um, yeah. so all of us have done research, or do research, or at least have may have some plans to do research. So, um, it, it's very it's very important for us to understand the requirements for consent forms. Um, as a member of the uh, Afri Science Network, I know there's a lot of chatter on consent forms, and so I thought that would be a great topic to talk about. I also get a lot of invitations to participate on surveys in the network on the WhatsApp group, and in typically, this is this is the general structure in which they, they they fall. I've tried to redact the names of individuals for issues of confidentiality, but in general, you see a message pop up on WhatsApp, and you know says, "Hey, my name is so and so. I'm from so and so department. I have this survey. Can you please um, can you please um, do my survey?" And sometimes you have some of these promises in the messages, like I promise that all responses shall be treated with utmost confidentiality. Um, and then sometimes you also have some instructions. Please kindly note that only all your state residents are expected to help with this request. Um, so this this is interesting because um, this is obviously being done in um, and you know in fulfillment of the requirements for maybe a, a thesis or a dissertation. And by providing a, a, some language like this, the individual no doubt feels they have, they have checked that box for ethics. So the question is, does this suffice? Is this, is this enough for, is this enough for uh, informed consent? The answer is no. So the, the purpose of this lecture today really is to go through what the requirements are um, for, for ethics. But there is an overlap, obviously, between the the issues of consenting and not just ethics but also the law so the consent forms aren't just an ethical document they are also a legal document in, in certain contexts and so we're going to discuss um the minimum requirement the minimum standards that have to be met for a consent form to meet those those requirements of course um given that legal issues are very contextual and country dependent we may not be able to cover every single requirement for every country, but these are just broad guidelines and perhaps come a little bit from a U.S. perspective, but I'm sure the principles will apply regardless of where um, one lives. So, but first of all, before we come to the consent form, let's talk about the responsibilities of the investigator um, when doing research that involves human subjects. It is the responsibility of the investigator to ensure that they have they are, they are an expert in research. They, they are at least familiar with the basic requirements of research. And that is typically assured by having these individuals take a training. So there has to be proof that you have taken basic training on human research protections. Um, there's also the responsibility of the PI to develop a protocol, to submit a protocol for initial and continuing review to an IRB or an ethical board. And if required, submit amendments and incident reports as appropriate. And then the closure. Every protocol that was open at some point must be closed. I think we're very familiar with, with, with initiating an IRB, but we often don't talk about closing an IRB application, which is the closure of a protocol. There are two commonly used um, providers of ethics training. Um, one is um, CITI, um, which is the um, collaborative forum that ensures that um, people can take the training. City stands for Collaborative Institutional Training Initiative. So you can go to their website, and if your institution is part of the city network, you can you can obtain obtain a training. So that gives you a certificate that you have you have taken training on ethics. Most IRBs will require some kind of certificate. So one from City will definitely cover that. If your institution is not part of City. You, the other option for you to have a training is to to get the certificate from NIH. NIH also offers training on ethics that certifies that this individual has met the basic requirements of ethics, ethics education. And so um, the, the beauty of NIH training is that you don't require institutional access. You just look, go to their website, which is here, or you just kind of the QR code and anyone can take the training. Um, it's it's a few hours, but once you complete the training, 
you get the certificate which you can submit to an ethics board. So what are some of the things to know when submitting a new protocol? Well, a good protocol should describe the purposes, the methods, and the procedures for the research. There should be an appendix section, which includes a consent document and all the questionnaires or other instruments that we use for data collection. That will also include the letters that you're going to send to participants or the email if it's an electronic data capture and anything that will be seen by the participants. Also, um, ideally, most IRBs will require that you have every single thing in one document. So please don't send a million documents, put everything in one long document. Um, so if you have extra documents, they will be in the appendix section. You clearly want to make sure that you review it carefully. There is no, there are no spelling errors, there are no typos. So you want to make sure it looks professional before you submit to the IRB. And also make sure that it's the final documents, the final versions that you are submitting. So what are some of the things that IRB cares about when reviewing? Um, at my previous role at CDC, um, one of one of the things I one of the things that was that was within my wheelhouse was ensuring ethics ethical compliance and so these are some of the things that we care about as an office when people submit things for ethics um, we want to make sure that risks to subjects are minimized that the risks are reasonable in relation to the anticipated benefits of course no one no IRB is saying that a study should be risk free that is not reasonable but we're saying that the risk from the study should be reasonable in relation to the anticipated benefits. I shouldn't be having to take a, a, a I shouldn't I shouldn't be taking med, you know, medicine for headache and end up with cancer. That is that is not a reasonable benefit or reasonable trade-off. Um, so that data collection is monitored to ensure safety um, if needed, that the selection of subjects is equitable, that privacy and confidentiality is protected. And that's very important because when you look at some of the platforms that I, I see people collect data on, you know, on the group. Some of them include things like um, like Google Forms, which really do not meet that that um, standard for privacy and confidentiality. It's not uncommon for you to have a scenario where people are collecting data in Google Forms and you can actually see who has submitted the responses, depending on the settings that the investigator put. So that that is not a good thing. And that informed consent is sought from each subject and that it is documented. So it's not enough for you to say, like the, like the example we showed earlier, where he's like, oh, please, can you take the survey? And I promise to, that is not enough. The informed consent must be properly documented. So what does that mean? It means that it has to be documented. It means that the individuals have to explicitly consent. You know, if it's an electronic data um, capture system, that would mean that there will be a button the users will click that says explicitly I consent. And in the data set, you ensure that there is documentation of that consent there. So any good data, co data collection platform will have a column dedicated to consent when you say, yes, there should be a timestamp that indicates when the responses were submitted. And that way, that meets the requirements that, that informed consent is sought but also appropriately documented. And that adequacy, privacy, and confidentiality provisions are provided. And then, you know, there are safeguards for vulnerable participants. What I also want to really emphasize is that consent is not just a document. Consent is a process. So just having one document is not enough. It's a process because, you know, it's a continuum. You, are provi you provide information, the participants read and engage with that information, the participants can choose to withdraw that their permission at any point in time. And if the participants are confused, there has to be a mechanism for them to contact you. That's why we say it's not just a document, it's a process. So your consent form must provide the avenues for all of these things to, to be met, right? So, um, and so that, that is, becomes very important. On, on, the, on the legal framework, the, it's also important that um, the consent form does not have exculpatory language. So what does that mean? It means if you, you're saying by by participating in this survey or by by clicking on I agree, you are you are waiving all legal damages that might arise from this study from the investigators. No, the consent form is not a mechanism for the investigators to remove themselves from future lawsuits and saying that 
you have waived all rights to a, a lawsuit now or in the future. No, that's not the purpose of you know a consent form. Those are some of the things that IRB looks for. Um, exculpatory language, but also language that is coercive. Um, if, if your consent form already starts with, thank you for agreeing to participate in the study, that is coercive language. I never agreed. Why, why are you acting as if I agreed? <laughs> you know, so language should not be exculpatory or nor should it be coercive in nature. From a legal framework, there's another important document, um, which we call the Certificate of Confidentiality. Um, it's because um, COC is used in cases where they, you, are, you, are, you are talking about an issue that is, of, that is very sensitive. So imagine you are doing a study among individuals who, are, um, who, who, are, who, are, who use illegal drugs, illicit drugs. So we're not just talking about cigarette smoking now, we're talking about drugs that are illegal, like, um, like heroin or cocaine, right? And you are afraid that these individuals might be might be concerned about participating because they might fear that you might turn their information over to the law enforcement. Well, in such cases, you might consider getting a certificate of confidentiality and including language about that in the consent form. What a certificate of confidentiality does is that it, it protects the individuals such that if I collect the data from you as a, a person who uses an illicit substance, not even a lawyer, a judge, can compel me to release that information to, 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 the, to, the, to the legal system. So that means that there is no force, no legal authority that will demand some directly or indirectly that I transmit that information that I just collected to them. So that way, the individual is assured that, yes, there's no way anybody will get access to that information, um, not even under the force of law. So, um, so that is a, a very important document. So you you try to look at when you know when you should use a COC, but if 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 your if your population is 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 very sensitive or the topic is very sensitive, then you might want to consider including a COC. In which case, your consent form also, must also include that language very, very at, at the very beginning that says this this study in Imo is protected under a certificate of confidentiality which means that not even a federal judge can compel us to release information um, in, in, this, in this study over to the, law, to the law system. There are eight requirements. There are eight required elements of any good consent form. One, it should, there should be a statement that addresses the, the research, why it's been done, the duration, the procedures, and what, how it's been conducted. That's number one. Number two, um, it should address foreseeable risks or discomforts of course, we you know we're humans. We can't see far into the future, but the extent to which you can predict that certain risks are reasonable and are probable, you should you should mention them. Reasonably expected benefits and money or incentives is not an incentive, it's not it's not a benefit from the perspective of you know um, ethics, and um, that's a different thing altogether. Um, expected benefits might be things like being administered an experimental medication and you know they might get some alleviation from their health health conditions um or any other benefits that are non-monetary you know so you know in terms of in incentives like i mentioned it's not it's not classified as benefits um alternative procedures if any if what what mechanisms you have for protection of confidentiality for example you are saying that in this survey or in this study you are not collecting any um, identifiable or potentially identifiable information. If, if that's the case, you want to specify that upfront. Um, you also want to specify whether you'll be analyzing the data in aggregate form or whether you'll be using direct quotes from a study. Of course, if you're using direct quotes, that increases the risk for individuals being identified. And so mechanisms you have in place for protecting confidentiality should be well articulated. Compensations, if they are in the study, should be pro provided um, separately. Compensation for treatment or injury. Um, con contacts for questions about the um, the research. If participants have questions, like who should they who should they contact, that should be well spelled out. And then um, there should be a clear statement that individuals are that participation in the study is voluntary. Individuals can leave at any time. They can leave without loss of benefits. So that means that if you if you promise them to give them money, 
if they leave any time, any time they can they can also get that benefit and also they can withdraw without fear of punishment or fear of retaliation at any time so those are those are the minimum elements that will have to be captured in a consent form so we want to look at two scenarios hands-on um how do you implement a multi multi-population survey that requires both an ascent form for minors and a consent form for adults. So sometimes you do, you're doing a multi-population survey that cuts across multiple ages. And most of the surveys we do, large population surveys are that way, where a, there are some questions that are for everybody, then there's some questions that are just for uh, you know minors and then some for adults. Obviously, you want to make sure that your survey includes both an ascent form. Ascent form is a, you know, think of it as, as agreement from, from minors, people who are age 18 years old less than 18 years old um, because minors cannot sign a consent form and then consent form is for adults so we'll, we'll look at the hands-on demonstration on how you can do that in your study um, and then sometimes you have you, when you're conducting in you know multinational service um, which i do a lot you, you realize that sometimes some countries have some requirements that may not apply to other countries so for example um, we're doing a survey now in some countries where in, in certain countries you are not allowed to provide um, um, incentives, financial incentives to patients within the hospital settings. So that means that in that case, our consent form cannot include language that they will be provided with an incentive after they do the survey, right? Um, in other countries, there is, you know, there's no such restriction. So we have to provide a language. So you, you might be running a, an international study where you have that kind of requirement to that certain individuals in certain countries see a specific consent form and those in other countries see another consent form. So the question is, how do you, in the context of an electronic survey or a web survey, how do you do those things? So would would um, do a hands hands on demo right now on 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 how you can do that on the Kai Scores platform. But um, before we transition to the hands on session, I want to see if you, if there are any questions from this from the lecture component so far. We we'll, we we'll take questions now if there are any. I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, with regards to the uh, incentives, I think uh, before the advent of uh, electronic questionnaires, like in those uh, very old textbooks, we we read that uh, inclusion of, like in postal questionnaires, we uh, scientists tend to include things like chocolate uh, to make the respondents happy and or a pen and also self-addressed stamp envelope and all those things so for the pen if like we in the field of uh, farm animal health if you send it to a farmer uh, he will not uh, he wouldn't have to look for a pen to fill in the questionnaire it is already in the envelope and also self-addressed uh, stamp envelope for the ton and some chocolate for example they all increase uh, response rate uh, it was it has been researched upon so and then here you mentioned that uh, in some countries uh, it is not allowed I do not know why do you think it may have an effect on the responses because those uh, incentives may likely have impact on the number of uh, response rates yeah so um so there are two types of incentives, right? You have financial and non-financial incentives. So, you know, um, non-financial incentives could include all the things you mentioned, like you know, you offer a chocolate, or you offer a, you know, a pen, or you offer um, a self-addressed envelope. Although I, I will say that that, that may not necessarily be, be, I may not necessarily view a self-addressed envelope as an incentive per se, because you're just asking them to return the information you send back to them, um, but that non non uh, non financial incentives in, in my experience are not as are, are not as powerful as financial incentives. I mean, everybody everybody wants the mula, right? So it's like okay, um, you can try, you know, because if you if you don't have the resources, you have to think creatively of how can we how can we increase response rates. Now, regarding the reason why some countries do not allow um, 
you know, financial. So I'm being very specific that this is about financial incentives. It is, and it's in a very specific context. It is for hospital-based studies um, because the idea there is that patients are in hospitals to receive care, and that one of the one of the as patients receive care from, especially in countries where there is universal care, it is. And, and, in, and in teaching hospitals particularly, that there's an expectation that, that patients will also contribute to the knowledge generation process in a way that is not incentivized by money, right? I'm, I'm assuming that this is the philosophical reasoning behind all that. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand. I don't know the, 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 the legal thinking behind why that, you know, just have laws and you just have to comply with the laws. But this is my hypothesis of why that is so. Um, and so the reason might be that, you know, the they, they patients should be expected to contribute to the knowledge generation process without being financially incentivized. And that might be the reason why some countries decide that as far as you're doing a study in a, in a clinical, clinical setting, hospital-based study, for example, you cannot give money to patients. Um, and so, Whatever the reasoning is, you, we just have to comply. So in, in that case, you um, you just have to bait. Um, so, but it, it, it's from, from the perspective of um, consenting, it becomes very tricky if you, if you just have a one size fits all consent form that says that participants will be given incentives, but in that country, they're not gonna be, they're not gonna receive incentives. That means you you know you you raise this person's expectation. So that that language there is is inappropriate because it's not it's not it's not entirely true, and so that's why it's helpful to create a very custom consent form for such countries so that the individuals are routed conditionally to the appropriate consent form for their country. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any any other questions? I can't see any hands here. Any other question, please? No, we don't have any question in the mail. Okay. All righty. Sounds good. All right. So let's okay. let's go ahead and uh, look at how to implement those two scenarios on the KaiSquest platform. Um. So for those who do not know, the KaiSquest platform is a research platform. It allows you to. Um, do everything from collect data to design your studies and so on and so forth. For the sake of this demo, we just want to look at those two scenarios. How do you use the ChiSquest platform to, um, to create consent, consent forms for a multi-population study that involves youth and adults? And then how do you use it to create consent forms in the context where you have different forms for different countries? So that's, that's just what we want to demonstrate now. So, if you have a, if you have an account in the Kaiserskurs platform, you log in. Um, if you don't, you you sign up on this with this button. Um, we'll we'll share um, a link with you afterwards that will allow you to access the platform for free for the next you know over ten months or thereabouts, um, so that you can use that for your studies um, should you need to. So I have an account, so I'm going to log in, and. All right, so I'll go to, so let's create a mock survey, right? That would simulate that process we're talking about. So I'm, I'm to start a new survey. I'll click this button, start new survey. And this is just telling you that the platform allows data collection for both cross-sectional studies and longitudinal studies. A cross-sectional study is a study where we collect data at one point in time. Like if I give you a survey now and say, how did you like the course, the lecture? That is just a cross-sectional study because I'm not following up over time. In the in longitudinal study, it is um, there's an element of follow-up. And that is very also important from the context of, of consenting because if you are going to administer a survey every, you know, if, if several times to the same participant, you don't just want to assume that because they consented at the first time, that that consent carries over to all the other waves. Right, so you have to set up your study in such a time, in such a way that the consent is done at every single data collection. Because 
each each data collection um, episode is an independent event, even though the, the data are connected, but you need to collect consent at every single time you're engaging with the participant. So the CASCOS platform allows such that when you set up your consent form in the context of a longitudinal study, the platform self-administers the stuff for you. So if you're going to follow up people at six month intervals, you don't have to manually come and do the follow up yourself. The platform will resend the survey to them along with the consent form that you set up so that you can, you can, you can do that automatically. So let's see how this works in, in, in a, a case of a demonstration. Um, let's start with a, um, a, 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 you know, the basic information about the survey. Let's say this, the title of our survey is, um, oh, by the way, does somebody want to volunteer a topic we can use as a demo? If not, I can, I can go ahead and supply a topic. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just go ahead and supply my topic. Let's say your, your survey is about prevalence of um, um, tobacco use. Prevalence of tobacco use um, in Nigeria. So let's say that's the, that's the title of, of your topic. And you select the location here, in this case, Nigeria. You select your aims. Um, you can type the aims manually, or you can ask the AI to generate aims for you, to suggest aims for you, in which case it takes the context of what you have provided, and it will craft aims for you. For example, these are the aims that it has suggested. To estimate the prevalence of tobacco use in Nigeria, I like that, so I'll select that. To identify the demographic and socioeconomic factors associated with tobacco use in Nigeria, okay, like that. And then to assess knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs regarding tobacco use among Nigerians. Okay, that's enough. Let's clear the remaining ones away. Then keywords, let's generate that with AI as well. These are the keywords that AI has suggested based on our topic and the context which it has, it has detected. So let's add prevalence and maybe, um, this as our keywords and let's clear the remaining ones now on the chi first platform since we're talking about ethics you are asked to check whether any of these apply to your study if you check any of these boxes the platform detects that ethics might be required an ethical review by an IRB might be necessary so for example if you say that your data involves any deception or coercion some in some studies we need we need to employ deception um because especially in studies that involve psychology uh, because it's that is just part of the study if you a study involves deception you will need the irb or question if the if it's sensitive topics like mental health or sexual transmitted diseases like you know hiv syphilis then it's very likely that you know an ethics ethics board might want to review that the same thing applies with sexual behavior, drug use, or criminal activity, or if you're collecting any identifiable or potentially identifiable information or sensitive information. Those terms are very similar, but not are not necessarily the same. Um, first of all, we have what we call um, protected information. Protected health information is information that is protected under the law, right? Um, so you can have information that is sensitive but not, not necessarily protected. For example, um, if you ask me about my um, sexual orientation, that is sensitive information, but it's not necessarily protected information. Protected information are specific classes of information, um, like you know your so social identity number, for example, or, or very specific classes of, there are specific categories of information that are deemed as protected under the law. So whether it is protected information or it's sensitive or it's identifiable, there are also certain things that are identifiable information that may not necessarily be sensitive or protected. For example, if I ask you what's your email, well, your email is not protected information and it's not necessarily sensitive, but it's identifiable, right? You can also have information that is not necessarily identifiable, but is potentially identifiable. For example, if I'm asking information on age, and I collect age in such a way that I can collect 
extremes of age, especially the, the other extreme, you know, and I have information on, oh, this guy is one 26 years old. Well, guess what? In the whole of the community, there's only one person who's one 26 years old. I might as well have asked him his name and address, right? Because that information is potentially identifiable. So when you are dealing with potentially identifiable information, I agree wants to make sure that you have collected, you are collecting it in a way that it is not possible to identify people indirectly. So in that case, I agree might say, how about you just collapse ages, for example, 70 and above in one category so that it's not possible to identify people indirectly with such metrics. Um, this, this, the same thing will apply to um, race, ethnicity. Um, when I serve on an IRB, there were certain studies who say don't collect data on race um, because imagine you're doing a study in, 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 you know, let's say dental schools in the US and in some schools, there may be only one black person who's a faculty member. So collecting information on their on the school school name and on their race, if you use those two things together, oh, you can identify who is who who outside what. Because if a school only has one Indian one Indian person on faculty or only one black person on faculty, just by them reporting their race, that makes the information identifiable. So any of those things, if it's identifiable, if it's protected, if it's ident if it's potentially identifiable or sensitive, will be required to for IRB review. If your study involves audio or video recording, that also raises concern because video and audio recording are, um, you, could, you could classify them as identifiable or potentially identifiable. Also, if your target population in includes certain vulnerable groups like sex workers, prisoners, or homeless people, pregnant women or children, people with a specific disease or disability, for example, you are studying people living with HIV, people living with diabetes, um, or any specific illness, or if they involve if the study involves children or minors, then selecting any of those will trigger uh, the platform to tell you that your study might need IRB and how to proceed. If your study involves benefits, substantial benefits or substantial substantial risks, so for example, financial incentives, other material benefits, if there is risk of uh, physical, social, financial, emotional, psychological, other harm. Risks that does it doesn't have to be physical injury like you're taking a blood, you know, sample that that it doesn't have to be a physically invasive procedure. It could be, you know, in this age where people are easily triggered, you know, um, questions that are deemed as triggering would also be classified as as being um, emotional harm to people. So IRB might need to review that. And then if there's significant risk of breach of confidentiality. Then IRB will need the, the the basic framework we use, you know, in, in a, it's IRB review is is the information you're collecting more sensitive than what I would discuss with somebody if I was standing in line waiting to buy groceries. If if the if the discussion would I would have with a random stranger on a line while waiting to buy groceries is about the same thing you're collecting in your survey, then we say that your study poses no more than minimal risk, right? But if you are going to collect any more information that is than than what I will discuss with a random stranger while waiting in line, then you know your study might be considered as posing more than minimal risk. So if I let's say I say that my study involves children or minors, um, and let's create the survey. So um, it's a Kai first platform is a collaborative platform, which means that more than one person can work on a project so which is excellent because you might want to um you might want, want different people to do different things so i might say okay please can you handle translation for the survey why i handle other things or if, if i'm working with students i may want to supervise their work in real time as opposed to them sending me their documents via email so that that platform allows for that so let's say i want to add um my email here or this in the email as a collaborator. I provide the email and then I select a role for the person, like for example, project owner or co-lead. So let's say this person's a co-lead. I can add more if needed, or I can save collaborators and proceed. So they will receive an email that invites them to the study. So now let's look at what we've done so far. We selected that our study involves a protected population, children. That has triggered the platform to raise up this banner, this yellow banner here. Your study may require IRB approval. Click here to set it up. When you click here, this opens up a form. 
this is the data we are affiliated with an independent irb that reviews applications sent from the platform directly so in this case you complete the form and then once you are done you you know you, you provide attachments here the consent forms and recruitment materials the cv of a principal investigator the research protocol and your cd certificate or equivalent for all research team members once you do that you submit it that sends the the form directly to the IRB or the ethical board for review. And so that reduces back and forth. If you've ever done an IRB in some institutions, you'll find that it's an extremely complicated matter. And it's also it's it's also the, the way the reason why another reason why we set this up is because not everybody belongs in an academic institution. If I finished my graduate studies and I'm just working by myself, I just work in my you know I set up my own shop and I'm doing my own thing and I need to do a research study that needs ethical approval, it becomes very hard, if not impossible, for you to go to a university and use the ethics board. You need to be affiliated with a university to use the ethics board. So the question then is, what happens to people who, are, who, don't, who don't belong to an institution? Are we saying they can't do research because they are not affiliated? No, that, that's ridiculous. So this allows for people who may not necessarily have an affiliation to so still Get their study reviewed and approved by a, an accredited ethics board that is independent so here we can say we don't let's just say we don't need ethics so we can remove that um now let's create um so remember that our purpose now is to create a study that has a you know consent form for adults as well as an assent form for minors that was our task packet number one so let's just create a let's create a, a, a question, just a random question in the survey. Um, let's select a multiple choice question and say, um, in the past thirty days, have you smoked a cigarette? So let's just say that is our our mock a cigarette. Um, label here is cigarette. And the answer option is yes or no. So just we have just one simple question in our survey, right? Now let's see how we can how we can add consent forms to our survey. Well, simply it's, it's very very simple, really. You come to questionnaire here, and then you click on consent slash assent forms, and then you click on create assent or consent form. The platform then will ask you which of those forms do you want to create. In this case, let us first create the consent form, which is for adults aged 18 years or older. Um, you can, you know, you can you can type whatever you want. It also explains to you what consent form is. It says consent form is used to get permission of adult survey takers aged 18 years or older before they start the survey. So in case you, you don't you don't know what that is, you can now type, go ahead and type your consent form here or if you don't know what to type you can just create click on generate default content that creates a some a form for you to you can you can edit so this one tells you that the purpose of the survey is to gain better insights on the topic prevalence of tobacco use in nigeria note that it is not starting by saying thank you very much for agreeing to participate in our survey that language is coercive because I have not yet agreed to participate in your survey. So you should not coerce me to say yes. Um, so you should just be neutral. Um, so it talks, tells them your, your unique pers perspectives and whatever, blah, blah, blah. So you can you can now edit the you can now edit the consent form to add information. And you can say, for example, uh, if you have any questions, please contact the investigator with the number below. You know, so you can customize. My point is that you can customize the information. This just provides you with default content that you can start with. So let's go ahead and submit the informed consent. So this is now a consent for for adults, and now that will be automatically administered when we launch the survey. But remember that our study was a um, multi-population survey that involves both adults and minors. So let's go ahead and add an ascent form to our survey too. We'll do the same thing. We'll click on this click on this i will add oh sorry here we have another button here that says already add new informed consent so let's do that but instead we'll select ascent form now 
for minors below 18 years, right? So it says, ASEM form is used to get approval of youth survey takers under 18 years of age before they start the survey. Again, we can type whatever we want if we wanted, or we can generate default content. Um, and so let's submit the form. So now we have two forms in our survey. There's a consent form and there's an ascent form, right? Now let's preview the survey to see how it will look like from the perspective of the participants before they take the survey. Let's preview. And if you're doing a survey in multiple languages before I preview, it's always a great thing to translate your survey because part of consent is that in my consent is not just a document, it's a process. And as part of that process, you want to make sure that it's a well understood process. People understand what they are agreeing to. So the problem is, you know, let's check, for example, the readability of the survey. Let's look at the survey info and let us see. Okay, this, from the platform has detected that <clears throat> the flash kid score of our survey is 56.93 and that the approximate grade level is 10 to 12 grade, or in simple terms, that the survey is fairly difficult. The language in the stuff is fairly difficult. That may, that may, be, that may, that may be hard, right? If we are now administering our survey to people who don't necessarily speak good English, they may, they, may, they may find it difficult to understand the terms in our survey. So we might need to translate our survey into multiple languages. So let's say that we're doing our survey in, in, you know, in Nigeria. I want to, want to administer the, 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 the document, not just in English, but also in Hausa, for example, and Igbo. What we could do then is we'll come to translation here. Let's add it so that I will make sure that our consenting process is very, very straightforward and more importantly, understandable. So let's add language. Let's go ahead and add, um, let's say, um, Hausa. um so they this is now the source language and this is the um the target language we have to do so you can now type in the terms here um if you you know if you want ai to assist you in that process you can click this button here it takes it and translates it into that language but that is by no means you know um 100% guaranteed of accuracy to your responsibility that as, as an investigator to make sure that the, the translation is accurate. That's why this text here says that if you're going to use the AI suggester for translation, you should keep in mind that AI may not be 100% accurate. So you, you translate into that language or those languages that you, you, you wish to have the participants read it in their local tongue. For languages that are, not all languages are equal, right? For languages that have a lot of text in, on the internet, it, it will be easy for AI to translate them. But for others where you have less literature, that may be, you know, that may the accuracy may be less. So, um, so that's something you want to be, uh, to be mindful of. But let's just go through a, a, a quick translation into Hausa. It's translating the consent form now. Sometimes it gets it wrong, so you have to make sure. That's why this is a manual process. This is manual translation with some AI assistance. So you want to approach it knowing that AI can make mistakes in things like translation. And sometimes the quality of what it returns may not necessarily be there. So um, it's always something to keep in mind. So I do not like this translation at all. Let's give it one more try. And so, in general, we recommend that if you want, if you, you should, this is why you should, you have collaborators to your study, right? You want to make sure that you are adding people who, for example, if I name my survey translated in Hausa, I would want to make sure that I added a Hausa speaking person to my study as a collaborator. And their job may just be to do the translation for Hausa, right? 
And then if I need to translation into other languages, I will also make sure that I add people who speak those other languages to, that's why it's a collaborative platform. So that you can, you can have many people doing this, you know, different tasks. So if you, if you, if you wanted to do translation into, let's say, Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba, you could have three different people doing it in real time. It's not as if one person has to wait for the other person and then they, they finish in, you know, it, it's, it's in real time, real time collaboration, really. So that allows you to be able to work faster and more efficiently. Now, I think this is the accent form. It's trying to translate now. But I don't speak Hausa, but I think this is, that is too small compared to what is. <laughs> let, us, let us definitely try again. That, that is, that is the too little text for, for all this amount of text we have here. I'm not buying that. Then they have a progress bar here that tells you how many items you have. Aha, this is. Okay. Um, okay. Almost there. Right, so we have completed up. Now we can now save the translation and it has been added. So now we have one more language added to our survey. So that when we preview the survey, let's preview it now. Your participants, they see the preamble text and you can change this text to whatever you want, right? If you wanted to change this preamble text, all we need to do will be to come here, click this button and say edit survey welcome message and then that will take you to that page where you can edit it but here i can say so this is where the survey will now determine what what to administer to you whether it's a consent form or the assent form you select your age if you say you are an adult age 18 years or older it will know that okay this what it should administer to you should be the consent form you can also change the language from english to all all the languages that um, that you translated will be displayed at the bottom of the default language. So if I wanted to um, have the survey done in, in Hausa, again, I would I would um, change that language from there and then I'll proceed. So in that case, my consent form and everything will be in Hausa. Um, if I selected youth, what to administer to me will be the um, ascent form and not the consent form. So in this case, I, I, I you know, I, I, I selected I'm an adult. And so if I accept it capture, so you see, this is an explicit consent. I have, I have consented and my response will be captured in the response data set. So here are the questions in the past 30 days. Have you smoked a cigarette? Yes. You say commit and that will be the end of the survey. If now let's do, let's review as a minor. So now we are a minor below 18 years of age. We we'll start the survey. You have an accent form. Um, the, the key thing about the accent form here is this language here. I confirm that I have read and understood the information provided above. I agree to participate in the study and affirm that I have obtained permission from my parents or legal guardian to take part. So again, you can change this language to any of the languages that were, that were available in, you know, um, your translations, and then you proceed. You answer the question as necessary, and you submit, right? So that, that is how the chi Squares platform allows you to be able to administer a survey for a multi-population survey that includes both minors as well as adults. Um, I'll start and see if there are any questions on this before we go to the second case study which is administering a consent form where you have um, multiple countries. So any, any questions? Any questions? Hello, sir. Yeah, Paul. Yes, I'm Paul Hassan from uh, Nigeria. I just dropped uh, my uh my questions on the chat box but i just want uh, 
Dr. Israel to really uh, answer these two questions. That uh, can I add people who are not on chi squares to join as my uh, research collaborators? Yes, then, can I, you, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yes. in the first one question, you said, where does LR comes where, where does LR come come in while using chi squares? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, and then, Prof, there is another question by Olua Fumbi Ajayi. He said, hey, please, what is IRB? I okay. joined a little bit late. Thanks. Okay. So three questions. Before before I before I answer the second question, can you can you clarify what that means? I'm not familiar with that that acronym. What yes, I'm talking about. Yes, sir. I'm talking about the literature review. Oh, Why literature review. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So, so in in terms literature review, but you are, so you okay. Let me answer the third question. Um, they they um, IRB stands for Institutional Review Board. And I I, oh. I I must say that that is a bit of an American term. In in you know outside the U.S., you know they are commonly referred to as ethical committees. So. But those are the same thing. So ethical board, ethical committee, institutional review board, whatever you call it, essentially any committee that is reviewing the study to ensure that it is it is it meets re ethical requirements. You know, so that is what we mean by the IRB institutional review board. Most research institutions will have a board. The board there are requirements for who can be on an ethical committee. One, you have a scientist. You know, you have must have you know researchers. You also must have people who are um, who have who are affected by the condition. If my study is made up of, if I'm doing a study of people living with HIV, the institutional review board must include somebody who is who lives with HIV, right? And so the the composition of the IRB is not fixed in stone. It varies from study to study, and I know most institutions have a large number of people who are on the ethical board, and so for any given protocol. You might select people who are available at that time to review. There's also a chair, of the chairman or the chairperson of the institutional review board who who makes decisions and who decides who should participate on a particular review. So that's essentially what an IRB is. Um, the second question about literature review and where it comes in in this process, your literature review you, before you conduct a survey, you should have already done formative research. Formative research, research is essentially this research that is supposed to help you with um, what are the gaps in knowledge? How do I ensure that my questionnaire is addressing those gaps, right? Um, and, and and so on and so forth. So you're, you, you don't just sit down and just come up with a questionnaire. There has to be some, an intellectual process. Like you have, you have, to, you have to go on a fact-finding mission to, before you can create a, a good questionnaire. Um, that fact-finding mission is your literature review, essentially. That helps inform inform you regarding the lay of the land and what what the gaps. Because if you're doing research, the goal of research should be to fill a gap in knowledge. Well, how do you know there's a gap in knowledge? Well, you have to go and see what has been done first, so you can say this has been done, this has been done, but that has not been done. Aha! My survey will focus on that, and then you create questions in that area, and then so the literature review will be part of your formative research that guides the development of your questionnaire. In this, this is just a play, ex a mock example where we're just looking at, do you smoke? You know, in, in, hopefully your, your actual survey will be more robust than that. Um, and so in that case, the questions you create in your survey will be guided by what you found as being the gap and you are you addressing, addressing that gap. And then the, regarding the, um, First question, who can you add as a collaborator? Anybody. And you can add anybody, they, they, anybody in your institution, your collab, your friends. You know, it's just like it's the exact same way you would um, write a manuscript, right? Like who can you add as your co-author? Well, anybody who you work with and who you you want to work with on that project. They they have to have an email, you invite them via email, and they can you can track their status. So if I want to see the status of people I have invited, I can click on this button here, collaborators, and it takes me to this page. I can see who has accepted and who has who has not yet. So this, I can see this person I invited is still pending. They have not accepted my invitation yet, right? 
I can choose to remove them. The fact that you've added somebody, you might add somebody and you find out that this person is really misbehaving. So you can choose to remove them from the project, right? And in which case they, they are removed and that invitation you send them is completely rescinded. So they cannot use that link. They can, if they click on the link to accept the invitation, it will simply show them that you, you've been removed from this project. And if you want to invite more people, you can again type their emails and assign them a role. Some of these roles are, at, are, are tied with certain privileges. So if you say that somebody is a project owner, that means that they can do anything you can do on that project. They can add other people, they can remove other people. They are like you, they are like you right? That is essentially what you're saying. Um, so the project owner is the most powerful person you can add onto a project. They can, you know, because the fact that I'm adding you as a collaborator doesn't mean that I want you to do every single thing. There are certain things that you might, that you might be causing more harm than good. Imagine I, I created questions and you came and deleted all of them. <laughs> that is not a good thing, right? <laughs> so when you add certain, in certain capacities, they are not able to do certain things. But when you add somebody as a project owner, they can do anything. They can delete anything. Um, so, um, but essentially, that's how collaboration works, and it's it's in real time. So you can see what they're doing and and how they are contributing. I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. You're I welcome. have Aliyu here. Aliyu Soyinbe. You have been raising your hands. Can you could you ask your question or mute yourself? Aliyu, thank you so much. Me. Okay, yeah. fine. Thank you, thank you so much. Yep. Actually, I I joined late, and uh, I'm thanking the presenter for the good job. I'm so happy and uh, inspired. So, how can we have access to this uh, Kai Square platform? Is it what we subscribe to, or is free? So, um. We have access, you know, um, sorry, what, I, do, do you belong to a, an academic institution? Yes, I'm a Which, lecturer at the University of Lagos. Okay, so what we've done is that we, we partnered with, NUC, with the Niger, Nigerian University, Universities Commission to provide access to um, all the universities. And the challenge, however, has been, um, we're just so busy with development that we can't actually go out and reach out to the institutions to say, hey, we have actually have an institutional package for you that is provided for by NUC. And so it's just lying dormant. So one of the things, so your institution, so there are many ways you can do, you can get access. One will provide access for you now as we speak. Um, Lungile, I don't know if you're on the call, um, if you're still on the call, I can't see who is who, who is on the call, but you can, you, can, you can drop the link for folks to access. So that is, yes. we'll, we'll drop a special link for you. Okay. And okay, that link will allow you to create a um, your own account for free, and you can you can use it for free for the next. We're providing free access for the next ten months or, so, or thereabout. Um, and after the ten months finish, you can get on a free plan. Um, the free plan allows you to do one survey every year and and do access the other features too on the platform. Um, if you want to, uh, if you want to increase your access, you can you can you can pay for a particular tier of access as you desire. Um, but the beauty of the institutional plan is that that plan is covered by the Nigerian Universities Commission, not necessarily by the institution themselves. And that's why at the end of the day, the, your, the best solution is getting your institution to email us. And it, is, it costs them nothing really, because that has, the arrangements have already been made with NUC. So, but finding ways to access those institutions. There, there are a lot of universities in Nigeria, 274 of them, I counted. <laughs> And so it becomes a lot of work. And uh, so, um, so th those are the options there. Um, I, hope, I hope that makes sense. Very, very well, sir. Thank okay, you yeah. so much. Yeah, oh, yeah thank yeah. you yeah. so much, bro. Yes, thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Aliu, for that question. You have the link already. Yes, sir. Uh, under the message section. Okay, sir. I think uh, we have a question here. Uh, Isaiah, he asked a question. He said, does Sky Square platform have certified ethical approval as against Google form you mentioned earlier? And I think uh, Michael here, I think uh, we have answered. Uh, Michael asked, he said, uh, can I also use IRB approval gotten through the Sky Square platform for studies in Nigeria? Uh, two okay. questions. 
All right, great. So the second question, it, it depends, right? If you are, so you can use ethical, uh, so NIH, the National Institute of Health, has a standard that the, the gold standard is SIRB, single IRB, right? IRB, uh, NIH, National Institute of Health, this is, they are, they are, they are so fiercely, um, the fierce advocates of the S SIRB policy, which means that a single IRB is enough for any study you're doing. Because the current norm is that if you're doing a study that is multinational, you might end up having to, or you go to this country, they say, oh, you have to get an IRB for that country, and then from that country, and then from that country. You might end up doing, getting like 29 IRBs if you're doing a study in 29 countries. That is a few inefficient from NIH's perspective and not completely unnecessary. Because if the goal, purpose of IRBs or ethical boards is just to protect participants, then the principles and the standards surely are the same. So, uh, but in issues like this, your institution's policy takes precedence. What your institution says is the last word. So your institution may say, oh, if you're going to, especially if you're doing a dissertation or a, or a thesis or a grant, your institution's policy might be you must get ethical approval from our own ethical committee. I don't know what your institution's policy is. If, you're, if, if that is your institution's policy, then you have to comply with it. Um, so, so yes, in principle, in principle, you can use the chi squares at the IRB from the approval from the the, the task IRB for work anywhere in the world. After, because the the accreditation agency that accredits the 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 uh, IRB affiliated with chi squares is the same that ap approves any other IRB. It's not as if there is a different you know accreditation agency. So, so yes, the the institutional review board on the chi squares platform is accredited, just like you have your accreditation for any other IRB. But what matters eventually at the end of the day is what your institution says and what your institution's policies are. That will be the final word on whether you can use it or not. So uh, sorry if my answer is not clearly black and white because it's, it's a very obviously very nuanced issue yeah. that would depend on you know local policies. I think it is OK. We can continue. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so, um, so you want to make sure, like I said, you preview your survey, and then you can um, you can then launch your data. Generally, it's also good good practice for, um, especially if you're launching a survey that is of sensitive nature, to make sure that you you collect some preliminary data first, so that you can see the lay of the land before you launch. You know, so that if there are any changes, you can also make them in the survey. So let's say we wanted to launch our survey as a in a pilot mode just to see where the sensitive issues in our survey are clear and whether the participants understand the consent. They might come back and ask us and say, hey, you know, I don't understand what you're saying here. We might want to make changes to it before launching the full survey. So let's set up our survey as, as a pilot study and launch it and collect some data to see how the platform does that. So um this, first of all, this blinking light is telling us that our survey, we've not set the date and time for the date to launch our survey. So let's do that. Let's edit the study timeline. For the start date, let's say we want to launch our study today. Today is, I believe, 29th. And we want to close the study, let's say, on the 6th or for the sake of just simplicity. The survey scope, is this the main survey or the pilot survey? Let us say this is a pilot survey and let us save the settings so now our survey is set to launch as a pilot survey um, and you can see the status here pre-launch that means we've not launched the survey yet and it's a pilot so if we want to launch our survey we can go ahead and click on launch so let's launch now so our project has been launched successfully so let us see how the survey looks like when participants take the survey. So let's look back at the responses. So you click here to share the survey. You, if you have the participants' emails as an Excel spreadsheet, you can upload it from here by clicking here. If you want to launch the survey directly to social media, you can click on any of those channels. Or if you want to just share a QR code, you can download this. Or if you want to just share a link, you can copy this link. So there are many, many ways for you to share your survey. So I copy that link, and then I can now share with folks or just paste it here. And then I can um, 
collect my information. Let me see. I will, I will have shared a link with you, but the, this, this, this um, Google, Google Meet doesn't allow. I can't see who is. I can't see the interface. So I'll just, I'll just take the survey, and then we'll see how the responses are collated by the platform. So let's we accept. Have you smoked a cigarette? Let's say yes, and we'll submit. The responses have the response has been captured. Now let's let me take the survey as a minor. Um, I'm a minor, so I can I can get displayed ascent form. Accept. I say no. I submit. So I've submitted two responses. Now let's see how the Kaiserswerth platform ensures that all the information you've collected, including including the consent, because remember we said that consent must not only be um, explicitly stated; it must also be well documented so i have i've collected um responses and so let's see how that works was i was i doing there i think i was i think i was taking the preview let me delete this and Okay, and then take us one one last one. It's a minor. Okay, so um, I, I don't know if you have any questions so far. There is none for now. Okay, already. So in that case, let's go ahead with the. Let me download this quickly, and then we can. Okay. So these are the responses we've collected. Can you confirm you can see this spreadsheet I have? Yes. All right, great. So we're talking about ensuring the, um. The the capture of information. So this is the this is how the data the spreadsheet that looks like when the the indiv individual has has um, submitted their form. So we want to verify that indeed because there are two requirements we mentioned earlier. Information must be the consent form must be um, explicitly stated, but also it must be documented. So that's what we want to confirm now. So these are the responses here. Um, this tells us where the individuals participated on the web or on paper, because the Kaiserswerth platform allows supports paper responses and offline data capture. So it will tell you where the data came from. This is the date and time that an individual responded, right? We are in pilot survey mode. That's why you have this here. The survey was it indicates the language in which the individual did the survey. In this case, English. All of them were done in English. Sorry. Um, this is the ascent form. This individual, this was the ascent form done. Yes, yes, right. And then the two of them, I did consent. Yes, yes, right. So it will tell you the form that the individual filled. So that allows you to be able to, um, to, to, to know. And if so, if, if somebody says, okay, what, how, what, what was the responses? What, when did I consent? I yeah, say as this is the exact time you consented, right? Um, and for legal purposes, that's important because you know, especially in the EU, the EU GDPR requires that there has to be an explicit, you know, capture of you know um, individuals' response, including the date and time. So that allows you to um, to meet that requirement. So it's it's not like just saying, hey, hey, please, thank you for participating. I agree. You know, I request that you participate. That 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 doesn't meet legal requirements. Um, with the Kaiserswerth platform, you can also download the methodology report for the study um, with a click. The platform will take the um, metadata and it will write out the report. So it's right, what it's doing now is writing the report that's finished. So it can view the download history and download the study report. So let us see what the study report looks like.
So this is the study report for the study we just we're just looking at that the platform has written in real time in just seconds. This is the title: prevalence of tobacco use in Nigeria. The survey ID. This is the methodology report. The date of report is 2024 today, and this time it's basing it on you know um, local time. Okay. Um, it, it it writes up the motivation for the study. It says that tobacco use is a pervasive public health issue in Nigeria. Um, that despite Nigeria being the most populous country in Africa, there is currently limited knowledge on tobacco use prevalence. And why that knowledge is important, it discusses all of those things and talks about the aims of the study. Um, it talks about the study design. This study was of cross-sectional design. It discusses all of that. It discusses the study participants uh, in total. Data were captured from four, four individuals. And it discusses all of that. It tells us where all those four people came from. They came from the web. So there are, there are three places you can come from, right? From the web, from email. Email a participants means that I uploaded an email list and the survey sent out invitations to email. So the, the platform will automatically send out your email invitations for you. You can edit the message that is going out. By the, in terms of delivering the emails, it will do that for you as far as you upload an email, list of emails. If your list of emails also has names, it will customize it by name. So it won't just say hi, it will say dear John Doe, if there were names in the columns. So you have first column emails, second column names, it will customize it. If there are no names, it will just say hi, you know, and, and administer. Um, it writes up the survey administration, it discusses the survey questionnaire. Um, in total, a total of one question was included. You know, and then it talks about the limitations for, from the study. And again, all of that it does within literally seconds. Um, so you can download the report to see what it looks like. If you have, if you want to look at the analysis, you also can come here and look at the um, download analysis report for the pilot survey. Remember, we're on the pilot survey right now. And you can choose to download for the whole population or for a subset of the population. So let's say you want to download for the whole population. It takes the data. To analyze the data, it has finished analyzing it. We can now look at it. Um, analysis report downloaded. Let's grab it up and see. So, um, prevalence of tobacco use in Nigeria. This is analysis report. This is a pilot survey. The analyzed population is all participants. And so, for each question, you have a table and a figure. Our accent form, there are two people. Our consent form, there are two people. There are two adults, remember, and two. Um, and then for the well, only one question, which was a multiple choice question, this is the variable name. If you notice, the variable names have some special characters in front of them. Those aren't just random. As you are creating the question, the platform notes the kind of question it is, how it's supposed to be analyzed. How they and how it's supposed to be visualized, and it creates those unique codes. This is like the DNA of a question. It guides the platform on how to analyze it properly so that it's one hundred percent accurate. Um, and so you have the the table for that figure for that question, and then the figure as well. So all of the, so if you have no matter the type of questions you add, the platform knows how each question is supposed to be analyzed and how it's supposed to be visualized, and it does that automatically, literally within seconds. Um, and so, so now we know that our consent form is, has been documented and also has been you know, captured. The platform also allows you to, it cleans your data for you automatically. If you collect data on Google Forms or Kobo Collect, you might have to manually start cleaning the data by yourself. Um, on the platform, this is all completely automated. So you can, you can download a clean data set just with a click, right? And if, when you download a clean data set, you need a data dictionary to help you understand what the very, what the codes mean. And we already have a code book here. So you download a code book that will help you to understand what the clean what is in the clean data set. So if you look at the download history and look at the clean data set, see what the code book looks like. So this is the code book. The topic again, prevalence of tobacco use in Nigeria is a code book. This tells you the general structure of variable names um, and what that what that means essentially. 
every data set that is collected, the platform automatically includes a new variable called the data quality score. The data quality score is created from four indicators. One, the platform is looking whether the person is a suspected duplicate. So if you, if you give a student a survey to go and administer and the person sat down in their room and filled all the questionnaires by themselves, the platform will know. And it will flag all the responses as suspected duplicates. It, 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 it does that by looking at um, certain signatures, certain figure, fingerprints, like the browser characteristics, like the device characteristics, like the IP address, and the, just the pattern of responses, right? So it, 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 we call it suspected because we can't say for sure, 100% sure, but it will flag it and say, these responses are all duplicates of each other. The, the platform also looks at straight lining. So imagine somebody says AAA for all questions. Then that's also kind of suspicious. Then large volume missingness is if, if, if more than 10% of all questions that an individual was eligible for were not answered, the platform classifies that as large volume missingness and it will report that too. And then speeders. Speeders is, you know, somebody finished the, the survey in, a, in, a, in, a, in an unreasonable short time. Of course, the, there's no time set for, for the survey, but the platform looks at the statistical distributions of responses. It says, okay, from the other people who have taken the survey so far, I know that this is this is the, this is the distribution of response time, and you your response time is like is five percent of the fastest times. Um, most likely, you just sped through the survey, right? So the platform knows that automatically, and based on all those four criteria, it creates a data quality score. So each individual row has a score. So these are the these are the scores, and these are what the, what they mean. So that this allows you to be able to sit down and look and decide whether you want to remove some rows either, you know, or to whatever you want to do with the, with the data. But you are, at least you are informed regarding how, how, how what the quality of your data that you, you have collected. Um, and so the code book for each question, the code book will tell you in the clean data set, yes and no will be represented as one and two. So this is just telling you that one means yes and two means no. So that's um, the code book that allows you to interpret what the what the clean data set is but again one of the major advantage one of the major and benefits that the chi squares platform really brings for me as a researcher is the fact that you know the data set is clean for you automatically so you don't have to worry about about that and so if you want to now change your survey from a pilot to um the, the main survey all you need to do is come here post the pilot uh or, 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 or close out the pilot so it is closed out now, and then I can now launch the survey as a as a, a full mode. In which case, I can now I can now start collecting data. But in my in my response data sets, they you see the pilot mode. It was one for if it's a pilot, and zero if it's for a non-pilot. So the, the data set is still the same, but there's an indicator for me to know whether it, it's a pilot. It was part of the pilot data or not. So I can, I, if, if later on in my analysis, I want to just exclude everybody who was in the pilot data set, I can do that very effortlessly. Um, uh, Prof, I will give you some additional five minutes. Yeah, yeah, we're done essentially now, unless oh, there are other questions. Yeah, I think there is one. Okay. Uh, this one is from Olua Fumbi Ajayi. Uh, he said, thanks for this. However, I'm curious to ask that some write-ups generated by this chi squares app wouldn't they be flagged as AI generated when subjected to Turnitin check? The, the and, goal is not okay. Yeah, and Ali was uh, he was asking for contact details. I mean, your contact details for further uh, clarification. Okay, so the details are. Uh, let me see. I think it's at the end of the screen. Oh, maybe not. Um, it's info at chisquest.com. Okay. So that's, you can, you can reach us via that. Now, the, the, so the reports here generated by the platform, this are not, this are, this are just standard methodology reports. They're not meant, they're just meant to inform you of this is, this is how your study was done and, um, and what the key information is. Then they're, they're meant to assist you to help you develop your final report. Nobody expects that you take that report and go and submit to a journal. It's, that is not the intended purpose. The yeah. intent, for each study you do, there has to be a methodological report. 
uh, which is not meant for peer review, which is meant for your personal consumption. I hope that clarifies. Yes, sir. Ali, have you seen the email here? Info at chisquares.com. Okay. Yes, I've seen it. I've seen it, sir. Thank you so much, Prof. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Israel Agaku, for this uh, interesting talk today. You've already met our weekends, and uh, <laughs> this is the second time of your appearance, if I'm, if I can remember correctly. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Yes. Yes, thank you very much, Prof, for all the informations. Uh, your informations are uh, very original and first-hand, very new to us, honestly. And this is this Sky Square platform is highly interesting and very innovative. Uh, I think uh, personally, I shall send um, a message asking you some questions regarding. Uh, the possibility of using the platform for a survey that has been on my mind and i think the chi square platform is going to make life easier for that and yeah thank you in, yeah in the absence of any questions or comment i'd wanted to ask if professor fashioner could say something that uh, unfortunately he has left and so i would like to uh okay I think we have exhausted our time, uh, Ajayi, unless if you can, Prof, I, can you take one more question? Sure, I can, yes. Okay, uh, Ajayi, can you go ahead, please? Uh, thank you very much, Prof. I really appreciate this. This is really a good one. It's eye-opener, and God bless you for this. And please, it's not necessarily a question. I was just hoping that there's a way we can assess the recorded meeting for further consumption. Our, yeah, the our, yeah the meeting is being recorded, and we are going to share it on the Afri Science Network YouTube platform as usual. And you can go to the our YouTube page and subscribe, where you are going to see all the past webinars. This is number fourteen, so you are going to see all the past webinars, and including this one. Are you a member of the Afri Science Network? No, sir, I'm not, but I hope to join. Yeah. Where, okay. where did you see this announcement? Okay, in the announcement, there is a phone number there. You can send a message to introduce yourself and say that you are interested in joining the Afri Science Network, and we are going to subscribe you. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to do that. I appreciate it. Okay, you. thank you very much. You're highly welcome. And Abdul Hamid. <laughs> Professor Abdul Hamid. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for organizing this uh, occasion. Uh, my question is, uh, in the case of the survey that involves maybe six states, how can I capture it in the cash bear platform when I come to the getting the sample and sample size and then putting the maybe pilot study? How they, so th that is a study design the sample size like we mentioned in our last class does not depend on the population so it, it, it when calculating sample size we don't care which particular states or set of states they are coming from right the sample size is in relation to a research question not necessarily the population so you can you can ignore the population that you can ignore the fact that they're from very specific six states when calculating sample size. Um, for for sampling, this the same thing. You know, if you, if you if you are just administering it via email, I assume that you might have an email of people who are from those six states that you want to administer the survey to. In which case, you can upload that email um, as as an attachment, and the platform will email it to them. Otherwise, if you are going, another option is that you can, the platform also supports paper and pencil questionnaires, in which case you can just administer to those states you have in mind. And then once you collect the responses, you can upload the responses back into the platform and it will automatically create the data sets um, on your behalf. Um, so those are questions that have more to do with how you are fielding the data and, and the list of contacts. 
which you will have to figure out on your own since you are the one who knows what your study population is. Thank you very much, Professor Israel. Yeah, and thank you so much. And uh, I've already started uh, delivering my word of thanks and closing remarks. And okay. we, we truly appreciate this. And we look yeah. forward to having you more. Honestly, Definitely. You are, yeah, your webinars are very insightful. And the knowledge is just very new, I must confess. I don't know all, uh, with others, but with me, they are very new. and. Uh, from all indication, even with other people, from the comments that we have had so far. Yeah, both for Thank the you. first and for the second webinar. Thank you so much, sir. And we Thank really you. appreciate that. And Thanks. And you can also feel free to share the link, the special link we've shared with the the rest of the community in the, the other channel so that you can also have access to the platform and use it. For uh, okay, work. fine. The Chi Square platform. That, that special link that Lungili may have dropped to give you special that, that's a spe yeah. very special link that gives you direct um free access so you don't have to go through any other hoops chisquares.com forward slash invitation that should request exactly yes yes that's I, okay fine i'm going to share it on the afri science network okay super yeah okay thank you very much sir thank you all right thanks so much okay sir we look forward to having you more definitely you. the next announcement i'll also sign up <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, exactly. We are going to share the forms. Uh, okay, great. I would, I would, I would, I'm also on the lookout and I'll sign yes. up. Unless I yeah. see. <laughs> we want to have our webinars more frequent. We can be, I, I, yeah, I think we should be able to accumulate uh, two webinars per month. Okay. And uh, if you ever need a speaker, them. an emergency speaker, just call, just contact me. I'm happy to talk at any moment. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you so Definitely. much. We will look into that. Yeah. All right. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. My All pleasure. right. Huh? Yeah, thank you. Have a nice All weekend. Right. Good everyone. All right. Bye, Prof. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye. 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 I'm going to sue Tom. <laughs>